You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jeremy Dronfield on the show with me today. He has an amazing new book. It's called The Boy Who Followed His Father Into Auschwitz, A True Story of Family and Survival. I'll tell you what, Jeremy, when uh, when I got this book uh, and and I was reading the NetGalley version of it uh, on my Kindle um, I, I could not put it down. It was, uh, what a fascinating story and, uh, fascinatingly told, uh, I, I was captivated. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Jeremy, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, it goes back a really long way. I have this really strange memory of when I'm, I must've been about seven or eight. And I got this, the idea that I would like to write a book. I don't know where it came from. And I had absolutely no idea how you went about writing a book, but I remember I had this kid's history, a history book aimed at children. I visualize it quite vividly. It was bright yellow with the title in red. And I wanted to somehow write this book. My idea, I, I stood with a felt tip pen, started copying out the text from this history book. I mean, I had absolutely not the slightest idea what I was doing. and But I just had this desire to somehow write a book. Now, that, that went away completely and didn't really come back until I was uh, an adult. I, mean, I I don't know where it came from, where it went to. It was there was just some kind of primal urge there that it you know, took decades before it was actually finally realized. That's so funny. Were were you a a bookish kid? Did did you were you one of those kids that could just get lost in stories along the way? Uh, I could, but not weirdly, not so much with books. Um. It sounds, it sounds really strange now, you know, for someone who makes a living writing books, but I did actually didn't read books all that much as a kid. I, I, mean, I, was, I was kind of an advanced reader as a little kid, and I was given books to read. So there were some books I enjoyed. I mean, a real favorite when I was about eight or nine was Emile and the Detectives. That was a, a really terrific children's novel. But... I didn't re I didn't really get into reading books that much until I was a teenager. When I was about 16, 17, through a friend, I discovered John Steinbeck and devoured all his novels, then moved on. And then was just from that point on was, you know, through that second half of my teens, I would have like five or six books on the go at the same time. You know, so I was, it was as if I was making up for lost time. With that, and that, and also that that kind of parallel, a kind of awakening of a desire to write around that time. Steinbeck is one of those authors that is is fairly polarizing. Um, some people love him, some people hate him. Um, but mm -hmm. no matter what your personal opinion is, um, he was a genius. Uh, I, I think we can all uh, agree to that. Do you remember what it was about Steinbeck that just pulled you into the way that he wrote? I I think it was it kind of ties into the way I write myself now. It's I think it was the the visual quality. I mean, I mean the first book I, book of his I read I think if if I remember rightly I think it was of mice and men and then I read uh, Grapes of Wrath after that and the Grapes of Wrath in particular the way he, the way he used imagery scenic imagery in that. You know, the description of, you know, the intimate description of Tom Joad when he first appears, 
you know, d- down to the tiniest details of the cigarette he rolls. And somehow Steinbeck had this ability to make you feel and see and smell and hear everything that was going on on the page. And that that is really what I try to do. I, I think I so I think that's probably what the appeal was there, although I didn't know it at the time. Well, you know, in in recent um, uh, you know publishing news, there there have been authors who um, use twists and turns um, uh, to great effect, and uh, you know there there have been talk of you know books that come out, and and the author will just turn the story on you in a heartbeat, and uh, you know people dropping the book and and mouths you know jaws hanging open and. And and all of that, uh, you know, Gone Girl is one example that I can think of. Um, but Steinbeck was one of the first ones to do that in of Mice and Men. You you talk about uh, a twist at the end that just leaves the you know the reader yeah. with 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 jaw slack. That one will do it. Yeah, and, and it people will. have been imitating him for you know the better part of a hundred years. Yeah, no, I I think with good reason. I mean, he he he. Did things I think with with prose that you, know, you wouldn't really think were quite possible. I think probably b- before him. Um, so so Jeremy, um, as you go through um, school and try to figure out what it is that you're going to do with your life, um, where does writing factor into? your future plans and uh, did you always know that you would be a writer was this something you aspired to but you know life got in the way um what was your path to becoming a professional writer oh really really random um <laughs> as with most people you know, yeah i mean apart, apart from that weird little thing when i was a kid after that i i I would occasionally sort of like enjoy writing things down, right? And you're trying experimenting with little stories, but I never really had any notion of doing anything with them. I mean, I, I dropped out of school. I wasn't good at school. I dropped out when I was 16 uh, and went to work. I, tra- I started training to be a surveyor. Um, eventually I got, I got into a job in archeology span and ended up going to university, uh, doing a degree and a PhD in archeology span and was, it was while I was struggling to try and get a, a career off the ground that I really started developing as a writer. I mean, my, my first experience with writing for publication was publishing my PhD research as a series of papers. And then I, I spent three years trying to get a job, get a career started as an academic. And I was supposed to be writing a book about uh, prehistoric art and religion in Europe and ended up writing a novel instead. And I was so frustrated by that point with the academic world. And it was, it was so chronically underfunded. And I started, I wrote about a third of a novel based in the world of archaeology and I just couldn't make it, I couldn't make it work and I wrote another complete novel and I got close enough I didn't manage to get an agent with that but I got close enough that I was encouraged so I wrote another novel and that was the one that finally got me an agent and a publishing deal and you know that's been my career since I mean I never intended to do that it was while it was really doing the PhD really is what gave me the gave me the ability to write a novel. I mean, that doesn't sound like those two things would go together, but it was my this urge I had had for to write telling stories that had never really come to anything. Finally, Doing a PhD meant that I could. I've, that was my first attempt to write something book length, my first successful attempt, and that gave me the confidence to actually try to write a full length work of fiction. And it was kind of liberating as well because after several years in the academic world, to be writing fiction where I was able to just make stuff up, I didn't have to have everything in place. I didn't have to have all the research all the citations, everything didn't have to be 
checked out. I could just make things up. That was incredibly liberating. Um, I got so, so involved. I mean, I was just writing and writing and writing every waking moment. I mean, I, I couldn't afford a computer at that point. I mean, this is back in about the mid nineties and I would write it all out in pen all evening. And then I would, up at the crack of dawn, go to the university, comp- use the computers there to type up what I'd written the day before. And this was day after day until I'd written a novel. And I said, like I said, I did that twice over. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world setting safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom-built world building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with, with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors, Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. In in doing my my research on you, uh, Jeremy, and your works... um, I was looking for for a, a key to kind of unlock what I thought um, made you tick or or informed your writing in some way, and I, and I think the the archaeology aspect of it is that key for me um, because looking over your um, your nonfiction work as well as your fiction work, um, there definitely is a a love of the past and uh, mm-hmm. you, you, coming up with stories, trying to to unlock uh, mysteries uh, that have come and gone, uh, but but that leave a lingering feeling. Uh, your your fiction and your nonfiction uh, kind of yeah. uh, all revolve around um, uh, those those themes. Um, what made you fall in love with the World War Two period? Um. I, th- I think that was, I mean, if you could, growing up in the 1970s, in certainly in Britain, we were just absolutely saturated with World War II. Um, I mean, I'd, my grandfather had served during the war, and I talked to him a lot. I think that's where that came from. But it it all, it was all fed by this obsession with the past. This sort of kind of it's kind of a yearning for the past. I, I'm I'm from Wales. I, I was born and grew up in Wales. And there's a word in the Welsh language, hiraith, which is there's no exact equivalent of it in English, but it's a sort of yearning for the past, and, it, and it's like a yearning for home. And it can be for a past that as is unrecoverable or perhaps never even existed. And it it's kind of a painful it's an ache and so i sometimes wonder whether the welsh are the only people who really have that and perhaps because of their history and that's what i feel all the time i'm trying to get to the past this this is why all my books fiction and non-fiction are all in some way 
fixated on the past and trying to trying to bring it back. Wow. Um, what uh, the, the book that we're that we're here to talk about today is called uh, "The Boy Who Followed His Father into Auschwitz: A True Story of Family and Survival." Um, how did this story come to you, and um, what what were some of the circumstances around you learning about these true people? Um, well, <clears throat> it was entirely by chance that I came across this story. Um, I mean, the, basically, the story is, is of Gustav Kleinmann and his son Fritz, who were sent to uh, concentration camps in 1939 and survived there for survived in Buchenwald for three years. And then Gustav, the father, was uh, slated for transfer to Auschwitz, which was you know, known to be a virtual death sentence. And when his son Fritz learned of this, he demanded to be allowed to go with him because he would rather die with his father than survive alone. And we know about this story because Gustav kept a diary his whole time when he was in the camps. He wrote the first entry on the 2nd of October 1939, his first day in Buchenwald, and the last entries in the summer of 1945 when he was making his way back across Europe, heading for Vienna, which was his home. And I first came across this story when I was asked, because aside from being a writer, I also do uh, publishing consulting. I you know, help other authors uh, get uh, shape and present their books uh, to attract publishers. Um, I was asked to help find a publisher for an English translation of Gustav's diary. And we, could, we couldn't find a publisher at all. No publisher would take it because as hugely important as a historical document as it is and amazing a story as it is, Gustav's diary is incredibly difficult to read. It's really sketchy. It's He didn't really write it in order to be read. It's full of really abstract references to people and places and events. And even a specialist historian would have trouble following it without constantly consulting their reference books because it was it was written for gustav's uh benefit um, yeah it, it, and, and he alone is his intention i'm sure yeah well as far as we can tell it i i think probably his main reason for writing it was just to, as a way of keeping hold of his own sanity more than as intending to be written. apart from one section at the end where he wrote a long beautifully structured poem about the atrocities that were carried on in the stone quarry at Buchenwald concentration camp. But the rest of it was clearly not written in order to be read. So, but it was such an important story. I felt the best way I could serve it would be to bring my abilities as a writer and a researcher to it and tell the story in a way that would be accessible to anyone. And that's what I did. And then it's, it was a three year, project about two years of you know, preliminary research and uh, preparation and then a, a year of full-time research and writing before the book was complete and it was a struggle even from there because when I first wrote a book proposal we couldn't find a publisher for it it was the same it was not quite the same thing over again, but it was an amazing story, but there's no market for this. It was the reaction from pretty much every publisher on both sides of the Atlantic. And, <clears throat> and this was before the tattooist of Auschwitz came along. And it was believed among, you know, widely believed amongst publishers that there was no market anymore for books about the Holocaust until it was picked up by a tiny independent publisher in Chicago uh, who, as I believe, only really took it because the commissioning editor there was uh, the, 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 son, the, the descendant of uh, Holocaust survivors. And he had a personal, felt a personal bond with the story. If it hadn't been for that, the book would never have seen the light of day, I believe. That is so funny because um, f from where I sit and in interviewing authors and 
kind of having my, I like to think that I have my finger on the pulse of publishing in a lot of ways, um, stories about World War II and the, the people involved in that, to me, are kind of hotter than they've ever been. Um, there's yeah. there's a certain ver, uh, ver, voraciousness about the readers who, uh, and I don't know if it's because a, a lot of the people involved in this historical time are, are dying and we are rapidly mm. losing that generation of people. Therefore, we're losing their personal stories as they as they die. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I think that we're afraid of losing the perspective that we can get from from these people. And it, it seems to me that these stories are becoming more and more important a, as we go on. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. I mean, what's going on in the world now was really, really vividly on my mind when I was writing this book. I, I felt it was extremely important not just to only not just to tell the story of Gustav and Fritz's experiences in the camps, but to tell the story of how that how the Nazis came to dominate. A society. So the the book starts with the the Kleinman family, Gustav and his wife Tini, and their four children in Vienna on the eve of the Nazi invasion, and it tells the story of how a city that was against Nazi occupation, that wanted independence from Nazi Nazi Germany how it turned almost overnight into a Nazi state, an enthusiastic Nazi state. And the Kleinman family were betrayed by people who had been their close friends, their neighbors and friends. And the way that the way it was made so difficult for Jewish people to get out of Europe by other Western countries blocking you know, refusing to take refugees, you know, both the United States and Britain were reluctant to take Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany. And I feel that the way, well, when I was researching it, I kept finding the things that were said in the press about Jewish refugees at the time in the 1930s were almost word for word what is said about refugees and immigrants now about primarily muslim immigrants now almost exactly the same things were said and that was that was so chilling i felt it was important to inc incorporate that part of this story in the book noveler is the best way to write a novel why quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need, Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily. It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year, and it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. 
All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. So you you wind up with uh, with Gustav's uh, personal diary. Um, and as you go through this, and it, it's kind of disjointed, and it's, it, you know, it, it definitely feels like a, a man making notes to himself. Um, at what point did did you start seeing the the story of what happened kind of uh, play out? At, at what at what point did it start to take shape? And you say, okay, now I know how to write this. I know how to communicate what he was saying from here. Um, well, it was quite kind of a long process, you know, because as you say, the, the, the diary is so difficult to read. I mean, I had interviews, you know, that, that Fritz had recorded during his lifetime and also a short memoir he had written. But that was also a little bit disjointed. Uh, but I knew that the central, the, the moral and emotional center of the book is that choice that's reflected in the title Fritz's decision to go with his father to Auschwitz and it was when I tracked down Fritz's surviving brother Kurt and began to understand the family this incredibly close loving family that I began to understand that decision and that was that point I knew I had to tell the story of the family I mean the book is primarily the story of Gustav and Fritz but we also hear the stories of the other members of the family. Um, <clears throat> and at first, I I didn't think I was going to have enough source material to do what I want to tell the story in the kind of immersive, you know, really full way that I wanted to. So I considered actually writing it as fiction, uh, and you know, based on a, a novel based on a true story. But as I did the research, I found I had more than enough material and then i had to make a choice about how i was going to write it and so i tried to base the style on you know, survivor memoirs like primo levi and uh, elia wiesel that kind of very pure simple straightforward kind of nar- narration and i knew right away that i i needed to start with this image with the image of the simplicity of their life in Vienna. And I started with this image of Gustav at work in his upholstery workshop at the moment when the the Nazi invasion was beginning. As I had come across this marvelous image in the description, the, the reporting of what happened at the time, of this snowstorm of leaflets that were dropped, by the Austrian government promoting Austrian independence. And they showered Vienna with these pieces of paper. And I pictured Gustav reading these things and put those two images together. And that gave me my starting point for the narrative. And then it just kind of fell into place, really. It didn't, there wasn't really that much planning involved or not not that i was conscious of i just by this point in my career i was kind of so experienced at selling telling stories that i just feel my way through them now i i just seem to I, i kind of know i feel you know the pace and how each event follows on and when where to make cuts where to where to switch from one perspective to another. I'm not really that conscious of how I do it. It's been such a long process of learning how to do this. It's be, it's kind of become internalized. Jeremy, I was, uh, I, I was born in the early 1970s. Uh, so uh, I understand uh, some of that, you know, being a kid in the 70s, a teenager in the 80s. Um, and growing up with this history of World War II and Nazism and all of that always being taught, being talked about. Um, but, you know, you can hear a story so many times and, and without being personally connected to it. 
and it sort of becomes sanitized uh, in a way. Um, and uh, you you know there, there's certain ways that we compartmentalize things that we hear in, in stories, and we we put this over here, and it it doesn't hurt so bad. Uh, it doesn't seem so real. It doesn't seem so quite so horrific, even though we know it is. Um, but you know we have ways of kind of dealing with that. Um, going through Gustav's uh, personal journal. And then, you know, writing through the narrative and reliving that history, as it were, um, and then adding, you know, the details around it. Were were there instances in the um, in the uh, in the journal that surprised you, or that uh, that filled in maybe things that you had always heard, but this gave it new color and light? Well, the story overall. I mean, within within Gustav's diary itself, the thing that kept surprising me repeatedly as I went through it was his in- unbelievable inner strength. Gustav somehow, he just fundamentally believed that he was going to survive. Uh, he talks about, and he, I mean, the, the Kleinman family had never been a particularly religious family. I mean, they were, they only went to synagogue on special occasions. Um, but I think Gustav had a kind of, kind of had a religious faith and he certainly re- references God occasionally and it being, you know, it, it contributing to his strength of will. But he, even in near the very end when he was in a, in a, he had been, evacuated from Auschwitz and was in another camp in Germany where he was, people were dying around him. Thousands of people were dying, starvation and disease. These were the very last few weeks of the war. And he was still writing in his diary, you know, I say a prayer to myself every day, Gustav, you will survive this. You, you will not let these Nazi murderers beat you. And how he kept that going throughout over more than five years of absolutely indes- or indescribable horror and just surviving by large, uh, uh, very often by just by sheer luck, it just leaves me at a loss to explain how he could have that strength. I mean, I think that it was partly that and partly the, their bond with each other that kept Gustav and Fritz going. So that was the thing that kind of kept repeatedly surprising me every time I came across one of these references, these lines in his diary saying that. I mean, historically, I learned a huge amount about the Holocaust. I mean, I I start I, when I started this, I didn't know I wasn't in it by any means an expert on the Holocaust. I just knew what most of us know about it, about Auschwitz and the gas chambers and so on. But what I really came to understand was how Auschwitz, how the Holocaust did not begin and end with gas chambers. It began with ordinary people, ordinary friends and neighbors, maybe out of fear for themselves, turning on each other and betraying friends it began and began with the 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 otherizing the 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 alienating the 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 the, the putting a whole group of people outside of the norm of society in the in the 1930s of course it was jewish people they were placed outside of society people managed to persuaded themselves that they were less than human, that they were a threat, that they were not a part of German society. And that was all it took for decent, nice, pleasant, friendly people to turn into accomplices to mass murder. And this was sort of kind of just shocking to me to, to read how this had happened. I you know, it still leaves me terrified because it could happen at any time. 
And that's why a book like The Boy Who Followed His Father into Auschwitz uh, is is such an important book uh, for right now. This uh, definitely peels back the layers and gives, uh, uh, you know, one man's, uh, you know, uh, view of what actually went on and, and how society changed around him. Uh, Jeremy, I am recommending this book to everyone right now. Um, in the show notes of this episode, I'm going to put links to the book where, where you can buy it. This is a must-have for everyone's bookshelf uh, for the summer, no doubt. Um, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all of the great stuff that you do, um, where can they find you online? Uh, well, I'm at Jeremy Dronfield, not uh, J- jeremydronfield.com. That's, you find everything is there. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, we'll be sure to put links there uh, and uh, where everyone can find you uh, readily available. Uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, well, thank you. Want to grow as a writer and take your writing to the next level? Give Pro Writing Aid a try. Pro Writing Aid is a grammar checker, style editor, and writing mentor in one package. Pro Writing Aid will never replace a human editor. Rather, it helps you self-edit to a deeper level so that when you send it off to an editor, they will be able to focus on the meat of your writing and not spend their time fixing basic writing issues. Pro Writing Aid is the only platform that offers world-class grammar and style checking combined with more in-depth reports to help you strengthen your writing. Our unique combination of suggestions, articles, videos, and quizzes makes writing fun and interactive. Writing can be grammatically perfect but still feel awkward and clumsy. Pro Writing Aid searches out elements like repetitiveness, vague wording, sentence length variation, over-dependence on adverbs, passive voice, over-complicated sentence structures, and so much more. Nothing makes a writer lose credibility faster than spelling and grammar mistakes. Submit clean, error-free writing. Go to ProWritingAid.com and use code HANK20 for 20% off of ProWritingAid Premium. ProWritingAid. Check it out today.